Success can bring you all the things you ever wanted, and it can take away all the things you didn't even know you needed. At the time this video is being made, Ichiro Oda has amassed an astonishing $230 million net worth. He is the creator of the highest selling manga of all time. One Piece has sold so many copies that not only is Oda in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most copies ever sold of any manga or comic, but it also puts his name in the top 10 highest selling fiction authors in human history, engraving the name Ichiro Oda next to William Shakespeare and J.K. Rowling. Oda is without a doubt one of the greatest and most creative storytellers of all time, but this level of success and talent doesn't come without its sacrifices. Oda's road to prominence is paved with a plethora of health issues, arrest, and loneliness. One Piece has brought joy to millions of people, and its success is something that Oda has dreamed about since he was a four-year-old watching anime and Disney cartoons. This video will act as a celebration of Oda's well-earned achievements, but also the overlooked acknowledgement of the sacrifices a lot of artists have to suffer through for our enjoyment. A manganka who escaped the industry even referred to it as quote, voluntary enslavement, with a more infamous example being when Kishimoto, creator of Naruto and rival of Oda, finally finished his popular long-running series. He reached out to Oda to brag that he can now finally take a walk with his kid on a sunny day. This would send the One Piece author into a spiral, but also motivate him to keep working so one day he could also take a walk with his kid too. But for now, I'm the Pirate Diaries, and this is the dark rise and controversies of anime's loneliest creator. Oda was born on January 1st, 1975 at Kumamoto City, Japan. From an early age, he was obsessed with all things anime and cinema. Anime, Disney cartoons, and Hollywood movies took up all of Oda's free time. By the age of four, Oda had already begun reading manga, and immediately after, he found out that creating manga was a career. He couldn't believe such a cool job existed, and from that point forward, he declared that he too would become a magaka, to quote, avoid getting a real job. The manga that contributed the most to this epiphany was a series called The Monster Kid, a story about a kid and his companions traveling through realms battling various monsters. Oda claims that one of these panels from this specific manga was the first one that made him want to draw, and he would go on to draw endless copies of his favorite panel, trying to get his drawings to look as good as Fujio's. He simultaneously had fallen in love with the anime called Vicky the Viking. One Piece to his a show that told the adventures of Vicky, a young Viking who would use his witty and imaginative mind to help his friends out of tight situations. Vicky would spark Oda's lifelong fascination with pirates and plant the seed for an idea that eventually would grow into One Piece. You can see Vicky's influence sprinkled throughout Oda's works. When Oda's dad found out about his son's newfound ambitions, he decided to teach him to paint, as he himself was a talented oil painter. Oda has credited his dad for his creative side, and he still shows off his dad's paintings to this day as the proud son he is. Oda became quite the prolific painter as well. One of his original paintings he did for a school project still hangs in his elementary school to this day. When Oda got a little older, his manga taste matured and he gravitated towards the Weekly Shonen Jump, an anthology of mostly action-based manga that targets an older demographic. Oda had started junior high around this time, but he admittedly had a rough time with it. He often didn't enjoy it. The only time he really felt happy was whenever he knew there was a new Jump issue coming out the next day. He loved everything from the legendary gag series Kochikami to the action commoners of Kenny Kumon. A popular series in an anthology called Captain Tsubasa would actually inspire Oda to join his school soccer team, just to be like the characters in the show. As you can tell, he was a very impressionable kid, and he remains so to this day. A lot of Oda's characters and themes are based off various pop culture icons like Jim Carrey, Eminem, The Terminator, and Reservoir Dogs, but also various Japanese acting and historical legends. Oda never dropped his love for soccer. It's football, not soccer. Oh, excuse me. With his favorite team being Brazil, Oda revealed in a Q&A that the real life Luffy would be from Brazil, so I can't help but to think this was influenced by the soccer theme manga. Oda would find his biggest influences though when he stumbled across the series Dragon Ball. He was obsessed with Toriyama's art style, and he reread this series more than any other manga. He loved his character designs, and practicing them is why he got so good at drawing legendary buff dudes. But the most important thing that he ever got from Dragon Ball was it showed him how impactful manga could be. When Dragon Ball was first gaining popularity, across Japan, Oda remembers going to school and just seeing how crazy his peers would react to the weekly releases. One day, he would see his school get thrown into complete chaos by a single chapter. Quote, when Krillin died in Dragon Ball, the whole school was thrown into complete turmoil. I remember someone kept running up and down shouting, Krillin died, Krillin died, with a jump in his hand. Seeing the influences a great story could have would completely reshape the way Oda looked at manga and reinforce his desires to master the craft himself. This feeling would last with Oda, and the second year of junior high, he would start developing his own talent, and he began drawing sketches 
is for a pirate based manga. Over the next several years, Oda will continue to draw every single day in all of his free time. This came at the cost of his sleep and his friends. This will be foreshadowing for how obsessive he can be when he really puts his mind to something. At the age of 17, he would quit soccer in an attempt to take his mangaka ambitions more seriously. He had learned about a very prestigious manga competition from a company called Joesha. It was called a Tezuka Award and it was given to the best manga submitted by aspiring creators. During the same time, Oda had taken a liking to a western anime film called Young Guns. This would go on to inspire him to work four months on a four length manga titled Wanted. It was an action based comedy set in a western themed world. Oda was very proud of this creation and he was so excited to submit it but he was also concerned his parents and teachers would be disapproving of his decision to focus all his efforts onto this and not school. To fix this problem he would submit his work under a pseudonym. Tezuki Himazu being the unknown prodigy he was he would take home second place and receive a 500,000 yen cash prize. Winning this award at such a young age would send shockwaves through the manga industry. Many professionals within the business started keeping their eyes on him. In early 1993, Oda would go on to get several interviews and his manga would get published in Shueisha's Sasi Mangaka. Around this time, he decided to drop his pseudonym and started going by his real name, showing that he was growing a lot more confident in his work and cared less about what others thought. His first professional interview would even be published in his hometown's most prominent newspaper. Oda's life was changing fast and it was getting harder and harder for even his haters to doubt his talent. Later that year, he graduated from high school and he entered Kyushu University under the architectural program. Although he never used his architecture talents in the actual field, I can't help but to think this played a massive part in his unique city and island designs in One Piece. During university, Oda would continue submitting more and more of his work to Shueisha. Not knowing his previous win already qualified him for a spot in the monthly offshoot of the Weekly Shonen Jump. This spot is where Oda would release his next manga, God's Gift for the Future. This manga follows a pickpocket named Brian that wanted to change his way of life, but he couldn't stop his bad habits. Through a series of unfortunate events, he winds up with a magical death notebook. It was gifted to him from a god that cannot alive anyone by writing the exact date and event in the notebook. Look, I'm just gonna say it. God's Gift for the Future came out in 1993, and Death Note came out a decade later in 2003. I'm not saying Oba copied Teenage Oda's work, but there's a lot of similarities, and I even found some threads already discussing the topic. If you read all of Oda's work in release order, you can see how each one gets progressively better and more complex. But he already had a knack for two things in particular, character development and world building. But being the near psychopathical ambitious machine he was, even at a young age he wasn't satisfied with only being in a monthly release magazine. So the following year in 1994, he decided to enter a contest named Hot Step Awards. With a manga named Ikiyoko, Oda won first place with Ikiyoko, giving him his first undisputed success as a mangaka. With his back to back awards and victories, Oda was finally believing he actually had a chance of his dream coming to fruition. So the same year in 1994, he would drop out of university to pursue his career as a professional mangaka. Dropping out of college is a huge deal in Japan. Even if you become a success, many people will look down on you. As school is seen as a rite of passage, Japan's unique outlook on hard work will contribute to some of the dark concepts we will explore in the later part of this video. And if you remember Oda specifically, didn't really like school and that he struggled to even find enjoyment while being there. But now, with some impressive accolades under his belt and a newfound freedom, Oda would move to Tokyo under the charge of his editor, Karu Kushima. This was his official start as a true mangaka. Oda had gotten a job at Shonen Jump as an assistant, as many inspired mangakas do. He would make practically no money, but it was a necessary stepping stone that all mangaka have to take if they just want a shot at publishing their own work one day. Some work as assistants for years or even decades when never getting that chance, and often a lot of them break under the extreme expectations pushed on them by the industry. Oda's first assistant job was for a Shinobu Kantanese Minodori Yama Police Gang. It was only for the last few chapters of the series so it only lasted just one month but Oda claims he was extremely busy this entire month and that he also gained an immense amount of experience about the production of a professional manga. After his manga was finished, Kantani would leave Shonen Jump. Oda was sent to another mangaka assistant created Mashiya Tokihiro through his final years of their manga, Jungle King. Tokihiro was also known to be the creator of the more famous Kappa Man. Oda would work for him for a very long time and Tokihiro was infamous for being very resistant with allowing others to help with important parts of his work. This was very hard for Oda because he had many ideas and the little free time he had after his 12 to 14 hour shifts he would spend hours drawing cool ideas for his own stories but also ideas he thought might work for his senseis but his boss would never entertain even one idea but Oda was still on a lot during this time period specifically improving his skills on background art and crowd art Oda has a talent for making the best out of a subpar situation during this time period Oda would create and submit several of his own stories to his editor Kushima and pretty much all of them would be immediately dismissed but he would try to not take the harsh criticism to heart but this would all change
change when Oda would create and release his next manga, Monsters. After thoroughly rereading it after its release and then going back to all his old works, he began to see many of his own inadequacies. This motivated Oda to work even harder and fix a lot of his mistakes. He started thinking, maybe his editor was right, telling him he just wasn't ready yet. He started appreciating the transparency and began only sleeping around five hours a night and started skipping meals because they just took up too much time that he could be using to improve his craft. When Kapama ended in mid-1996, his new boss would also move on from Shueisha, and Oda would enter his final assistant tenure under the esteemed Nobuhiro Watusuki. He was now working on the best-selling manga, Roni Kenshin or Samurai X. This would be huge for Oda, but Tuski was one of the most popular manganka not just in Shonen Jump, but in all of Japan. He was also known for having a way more laid-back style than Oda's previous bosses. Watusuki allowed his assistants to be involved in his work, speak their mind, and would even review their ideas seriously. That doesn't mean he would just approve any of them, but he felt like being involved and getting a hands-on experience was the best way to learn, not just doing busy work for your boss. Oda would thrive in this kind of environment, and one of his ideas would actually pass all the hurdles and was even featured in Ronnie Kenshin manga itself. He is credited with coming up with the character Hojo Kamatari, the Great Scythe. This was huge for Oda and it added a lot of credibility to his suggestions moving forward. Oda would never forget the faith of Tuski Sensei had in him and unfortunately this would come with some grave consequences later on. Oda was really enjoying his time in Watuski's studio but he remained troubled by the fact that his own ideas for manga drafts continuously got rejected. Oda decided since all his new ideas wasn't cutting it he would revamp his original idea for anime and a last resort style effort Oda began to work on a pirate themed manga. He decided to call it Romance Dawn. Not feeling hopeful, Oda would submit it to his editor, but to Oda's surprise, Mishimo would actually be very impressed by it and would approve for it to go on to further development. It would debut in a Sonin Jump summer special and receive much praise from the readers. During the production of Romance Dawn, Oda would fall under the supervision of a new editor, Takanori Asada. Asada would also believe in Romance Dawn, and he would arrange for Oda to fill an unexpected gap in the weekly Shonen Jump magazine that was coming up. This was an incredibly rare and unique opportunity. Oda accepted, and he immediately created the second version of Romance Dawn. Within two weeks, it was approved by Asada as well. But a weird thing was happening. The reader feedback was positive and they loved the unique pirate themed story. And Oda's handlers also believed in it, but the higher ups were very skeptical and doubted Oda's concepts. They straight up refused it in its entirety. They didn't want to try anything new. They wanted more of what had already worked, but Oda specifically set out to make the exact opposite. And this was because of two of Oda's earlier influences, Dragon Ball itself. He loved the fights and designs, but he wished it was more story oriented with more long term term payoff for the readers. And a much more random influence was the Wizard of Oz. Oda loved the adventure aspect of the Wizard of Oz and he even implemented it in many of his own works, but he hated the ending of the classic movie. He thought that the real treasures we made along the way trope was completely stupid and that fans deserve build up and payoff. Oda basically was inventing the slow burn style of mangas, a manga that pulled you in through well building and not just flashy fights. Lucky for Oda, Asada wasn't having any of his supervisor's nonsense. He would wage war on them, proclaiming that Oda has something great on his hands and he would continue this campaign for him for months. In May 1997, One Piece had finally been approved for publishing in the Weekly Shonen Jump magazine. So if you love One Piece, make sure you show some respect for Osada because if it wasn't for him, we might have never been blessed with such a great story. And pretty soon after, Oda resigned from being Watusuki's assistant on good terms and he became a full-fledged professional magaka himself at the age of only 22. His adventure was about to reach heights and falls that he never could have imagined. And if you want to follow me on my own adventure to be the pirate king of YouTube, like this video. The like goal for this video will be 199 likes. This video was supposed to be my 5,000 subscriber special, but I was so excited to drop it, I couldn't wait. This is it. Oda's obsessive nature and hard work had finally paid off, and he wasn't about to let it go to waste. He would double down his efforts one more time, and from this point forward, things would start moving incredibly quickly. Oda would take everything he had learned and created over the years and start immediately drafting the very first eight chapters of One Piece. Osada would lend him a hand and help him refine his ideas, and also offer some advice that he thought would give one piece a higher chance of success. After all, he was invested in this too now. He gave Oda the advice of spicing up the first couple chapters. He thought Oda had some great concepts, but that it wasn't exciting enough. He needed more stakes, something to hook people and leave them wanting more. This led to the idea of the Shanks incident that happened in the first chapter. I personally think this was a great decision and really set the tone for the rest of the story. In July of 1997, Weekly Shonen Jump released their 34th issue and premiered the very first chapter of One Piece, titled Romance Dawn. Giving homage to his Romance Dawn manga that started at all. When they was finished, they was pretty sure they had something great in their hands, but they were so nervous that it wouldn't do well. They just couldn't shake those butterflies. And when the first volume would be released, Oda and his editor would hide in a bookstore and watch the customers. And when they seen a little boy buying the One Piece volume, they would shout with pure joy. This is the cutest and one of my personal favorite One Piece facts. And by the end of One Piece,
Piece's very first year, One Piece sold over 300,000 copies, making it an undeniable hit. But this is again nothing compared to what was about to happen. Only one year later, this number would grow to 6 million copies sold, with no sign of slowing down. By 1999, One Piece had reached over 17 million prints. In the same year, he would receive a full-length anime adaptation, which would be another instant smash across Japan. By 2001, Oda was only 26 years old, and he had the world at his fingertips. He was a best-selling magaka and getting all the interviews and festival bookings he could even handle. But the most life-altering appearance would happen at Jump Fest at 2002. While watching the performances, he saw 22-year-old Chiaki Inaba, a model, idol, actress, campaign girl, and race queen. During her show, she would perform in a Nami Swine cosplay, showing her love for her favorite anime character. That just happened to be created by Oda himself. Her beauty and talent left Oda smitten. It was like a romance anime scene. He had no choice but to introduce himself, which he did so later the same day. They would hit it off and her personality had him hooked. Over the next two years, they'd begin seeing each other, squeezing in dates between her performances and Oda's busy work schedule. In 2004, they would get married, opting to have a private wedding that only their closest friends would attend. Around 2004, One Piece and Shonen Jump was more popular than ever. Manga and anime were spreading worldwide, but there was an unprecedented surge in anime's popularity in a specific Western country, the United States. The catalyst for this weep takeover would be thanks to three Shonen anime in particular, One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach. They will be deemed the big three, a title bestowed on the three most popular anime of the 2000s. The three series completely carry Shonen Jump in this entire time period. Every anime or manga fan in the world had one of these three in their top spot. This era would later be called the golden age of Shonen Jump. The gap in sales of these three versus every other series was mind blowing. And to this day, the consistency of their popularity would never be repeated. All three of this manga's creators were living their wildest dream. But anyone with this level of ambition doesn't just want to be top three, they want to be number one. The two creators with the most smoke for each other would be One Piece's Oda and Bleach's Kubo. These two manga titans have had a 20 year long beef that has left their fans constantly comparing the two. The origins of this entanglement actually started because of a previously mentioned award and spot that Oda got for Romance Dawn. Kubo had entered the same competition and felt his win was assuring and that it would launch his own professional magaka adventure. But after Bleach was outvoted by Romance Dawn, pushing his dreams back years, Bleach wouldn't be released and jumped to 2001. And Kubo directly held Oda responsible. In a 2017 interview, when asked how he felt about his rival, he would say they're responding, I hate Oda. He also revealed that the two had a hairy run-in in the 1990s. A few years later, Oda would have a chance to respond in his own interview during a Bleach exhibit for his 20th anniversary. He was asked about Kubo and said, quote, years ago, Kubo publicly announced he hates me. Do you want to know if I hold a judge against him? Yes, yes I do. He went on to say he didn't know Kubo meant it in a particularly rude way or if it was a competitive way because he knows that Kubo has a very competitive spirit. He has always been a hard worker, but Oda does say he has some audacity to say that in public, basically letting everybody know that I'm always still down for the smoke. He would draw Kubo's character Ichigo in One Piece art style and submit it to the exposition. Look, I love both of these anime and their lives sounding like real life anime rivals makes their series even better. It shows how much they both love and believe in their series. Oda and Naruto's creator Kishimoto also considered themselves rivals, but in a very different way. In 2015, Oda admitted that Naruto is more popular than One Piece worldwide, but he appreciates it, but it makes him a little jealous. In 2016, Kishimoto said that he wanted to surpass One Piece in manga sales, but sadly he was never able to do so before Naruto ended. Since One Piece is still going and its popularity in the rest of the world has exploded in recent years, the final results aren't in yet. But either way, the two have been the most dominant two in the world for almost two decades. Their respect for each other is evident as shown throughout both series, Easter eggs are hidden, shouting out each other's manga. But the most wholesome but scary example happened in 2013. Oda had become notorious for his machine-like work ethic. He was only sleeping three hours a night and he often would sleep at his work desk so he could wake up and be able to get back to work faster. This would cause his health issues to disintegrate and he would be hospitalized. Knowing Oda doesn't like to take days off, Kishimoto would show up to his hospital room to check on his friend and he would be shocked to see that Oda was working in his hospital bed. He was drawing an up and coming One Piece chapter. Kishimoto understood this level of work ethic better than anyone else on the planet. Instead of asking him to stop, he pulled up a chair and helped Oda with his work because he felt that's what he really needed. It would later be revealed that this was the legendary Dress Rosa arc, a personal favorite arc of mine. As you can see, my avatar's design is based off this arc's antagonist. They really wanted this arc to be special to not let his fans down because of his sickness. As of 2023, One Piece has sold more than 500 million copies, selling more copies than Batman and Harry Potter. Oda is the best selling mangaka of all time and the 10th highest selling fiction author in human history. These stats are hard to ignore even on the collegiate level. The anime adaptation of his manga is a smash hit and is growing more popular every day. Olympians have struck One Piece poses before winning medals. Hollywood celebs have declared their love for One Piece like Avril Lavigne who would eventually send Oda to 
two songs for one of his movies. Jamie Lee Curtis would mention Robin as her favorite character on several Q&As. Marvel director Taka Waititi rocked a Luffy sweater on several occasions. One Piece's film release earned over 15 billion yen, making it the sixth highest grossing movie in Japanese history. The four-year-old that wanted to be a great manga creator would be so proud of Oda, but just what has he sacrificed for this level of success? We touched on it a little bit in the Kishimoto segment, but to really understand or believe the truth that I'm about to say, you have to understand a terrifying concept in Japan called the Kairoshi. Kairoshi is a phenom in Japan that translates to overworked death. In Japan, the woke culture is a lot more extreme than most people outside of Asia can even comprehend. Japan has a zero excuse policy. In these environments, you are expected to finish all of your work you are given no matter how long it takes you. Even if you finish your work in a reasonable time, you are not permitted to leave until anyone that is your senior is also finished with their work. If they aren't finished, you are expected to go help them instead of going home to see your family. In a 2012 documentary, a filmmaker by the name of Algaro Pacheco visited Japan when she heard about this concept. She was shocked to see how common this was. She would follow salary men from their jobs and would discover that dozens of them would pass out on the streets from complete exhaustion, unable to even make it home or even move. These extreme hours leads Japan to having high percent of work related fatalities from stress, heart attacks, or sadly self inflicted. As of 2022, 23% of Japanese workers log more than 80 hours of overtime each month. Because of this, one in five Japanese workers are at risk of passing away from Kairoshi. The Japanese government never even acknowledged this problem. That was until a 24 year old who had logged more than 105 hours of overtime wrote on social media that she was physically and emotionally shattered. She leaped off a tall building soon after to her end. Unfortunately, this isn't uncommon. BBC said that this is the single highest COD of men aged 20 to 44 in the country. There is even an infamous unalive yourself force in Japan that is the go to spot to do so. The forest gained worldwide acknowledgement when a controversial YouTuber, Logan Paul, went there for a day of vlogging. He filmed a victim of Kiroshi while his friends laughed in the background. Please understand though, this is a different culture, so don't judge them too harshly. They have their reasons, and I'm not saying that their work culture is okay, but it's a very complicated, nuanced subject. The leading theory though, is that this was Japan's way of restoring its economy after World War II, with the mindset being that your company is your family and you should give it your all. I don't think these traits or phenomena exactly are comparable to Oda for one reason. Oda does these things willingly. No one is forcing him to do so. With his level of wealth and influence, he could easily retire or reallocate some of the more menial tasks to his employees. Instead, he opts to do them himself because he just kind of enjoys doing it. That doesn't mean though it makes his fans any less concerned. Based on Oda's own words and interviews with his editors, Oda works 21 hours a day. The few hours he sleeps is often not even concurrent, but instead broken up into 30 minute intervals throughout his workday, just whenever he gets a chance. That way he doesn't have to relocate and can get back to work faster. When he does get to sleep three straight hours, he aims for 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. That way he is still the first back at the office. Other Magaka in the industry refer to Oda as a machine. It's even though he is producing a weekly manga, his art is still on par with monthly releases. As where some manga like Villain Saga have entire months to work on their releases, Oda has to come up with chapters every single week. The anime is similarly on a weekly release schedule, but he still manages to compete with the seasonal series in quality. He does all of this while working with the smallest team possible so he can feel more attached to his work. This goes as far as when he has to retell past events, he redraws them in their entirety instead of reusing old art to save time like most artists do. His editors reported that he thinks and talks about One Piece 24-7, even when he isn't working. When his editor, Nahiki Kawashama, joined Oda's team, he said Oda told him to quote, die for One Piece. Oda went on to assure him, if you destroy your health due to your work ethic, I will forever take care of your family financially, I promise you. But look, don't think of Oda as a bad boss, just an acknowledgement of how serious they take what they are creating. I watched and read dozens of interviews in preparation for this video, and I couldn't find one of any of his employees ever saying any anything negative about him. Everyone that has worked for Oda said it is a fun and welcoming environment that just by seeing how hard he worked, it makes them want to work harder so they can contribute to the greatness that is One Piece. Oda doesn't even want fame, he just wants to create a great series. In all of his interviews, he hides his face or requests that they cover it with post edits. Japan loves Oda. He can't walk down the street without being swarmed by fans. That being said, his unhealthy life leaves them very worried and Oda knows his fans are concerned. Even after 20 years, his work schedule hasn't eased up in the slightest. In a 2021 TV interview, Oda opened up about how he doesn't have time to bathe, shave, or even eat. He gets so lost in his work that his assistants have to come up to him and ask him, please, Oda, eat something. He does just forget sometimes, but other times, he doesn't eat on purpose. In a 2012 interview, Oda said, the only time I can think of new ideas is to think about it a lot without sleeping or eating because humans can only come up with truly new ideas when they have reached their limits. So every time I'm done with one of my manuscripts, I am completely exhausted. The statement is both beautiful and sad. 
especially when you factor in that Oda has got moderate diabetes and gout as a result of his work schedule and being in his work chair for so many hours at a time. In the same interview, he said he always bathes before seeing his family though to wash off his work mode, but that he rarely gets a chance to ever see them. As we mentioned, after Naruto ended, Kishimoto bragged to Oda that he can finally take a walk with his son. As a flex to Oda that he finally finished his series, but as a fellow obsessive, he knew the kind of pressure Oda still lives under and what he sacrifices. Them having a personal relationship makes me feel like this was Kishimoto's way of pleading for Oda to take a break sometimes. Oda only gets to visit his home once a week and he sleeps in his studio the other six days. So he only sees his daughter and wife four times a month. One reason is he finds it necessary to keep his weekly deadlines. The second and sadder reason is that Oda fears if he spends too much time with his family that he will want to stop making One Piece because he will miss them too much. One of the only times Oda ever wanted to feature really quick One Piece was on one of his weekly visits with his daughter when she said to him, Dad, you were too busy to spend time with me. Oda is currently bringing in $30 million a year from One Piece royalties alone. He is currently the richest Maganka to ever live, so his dedication to his craft is completely a choice as he has long since passed the threshold of retirement. Oda keeps going to make all of his fans and people who believe in him proud. In a magazine interview in 2017, Oda said, My fans are worried about my short sleep, but sleep is just a waste of time to me. I prefer collecting information from manga. I want to become a robot that doesn't need sleep. Even when I go on trips with my family, I don't sleep much. This level of obligation to his fans is endearing, but his loyalty to his former sensei would cause the most damaging controversy in Oda's entire career. In November of 2017, Tokyo Metropolitan Police led a raid on a resident's house they had been investigating on suspicion of the sale of CP. During the analysis of the perp's computer, they found the evidence they were looking for, but they also discovered a link that led them shockingly to the one and only Nobuhiro Watsuki. Yes, the creator of one of Kenshin and the most prolific sensei to our own Ichiro Oda. Shortly after, Watsuki's house and studio was raided. The investigators' suspicions were unfortunately confirmed and over 100 DVDs were confiscated as evidence, with some of the victims on the tapes being as young as 10 years old. He was promptly arrested and during the interrogation, he immediately confessed to everything and went into an unnecessary amount of detail to the investigators. I like girls in the higher grades of elementary school to the second grade of junior high. After he was charged, Shueisha put his series on indefinite hiatus. This sent shockwaves to Japan because up until this point, he was one of the best selling and most respected magakas ever. He was responsible for lots of new rising talent. His reputation was tarnished, but he controversially received the lightest sentence possible legally. A fine of only $1,800 was paid and he never served a single day in jail. People were understandably outraged when this information became public, which is how our Oda stumbled into the crosshairs of this PR disaster. It all started with a tweet from Shonen Jump stating that Oda and Watusuka will be doing a joint interview on April 24th, 2020. During the Q&A, Oda was asked what it was like working for Dotuski, and he answered honestly, I worked for him for just under four months, which may have been the happiest moment of my entire life. The fan base was instantly split down the middle, one side declaring that even reminiscing fondly about someone who did what Watusuki was charged of, it was just blasphemy, and they felt it was some way supporting him. This side even shared a short-lived cancel Oda hashtag. The other side felt that since Oda had never done anything of the sort himself and didn't even know anything about it, he couldn't be forced to rewrite his own history that led him to where he is now. Even Watusuki's wife didn't know anything about what he was up to. I think the truth, as always, lies somewhere in the middle. Oda is without a doubt one of the greatest and most successful writers in human history, but let me know what you think about Oda Sensei in the comments. And most importantly, who should I make a video on next? To be continued.